hello everyone and welcome to Magma Rages episode 5. Uh, with me I've got uh, Zemok uh, and Pandemonia. <laughs> and today we're going to be discussing, we're going to be answering the question of is aggro really that easy? Uh, is it that easy to play? Is it the, you know, the simplest form of Hearthstone? Um, so to start off, I, I just want a, a disclaimer. Uh, neither of us are, or none of us are really like hardcore aggro players, I would say. Uh, we all play aggro uh, when we need to because it's good. I mean, my personal uh, opinion is that you need to be able to play what's good in any given meta, whether that be aggro or control warrior or dragon priest. Uh, and to be the best player you can, you need to learn how to play uh, every different archetype and every different deck. Uh, yeah. So, you guys have any thoughts on on that? Just uh, you know, learning to play aggro and other uh, archetypes. Uh, oh yeah. yeah. I mean, I've been in multiple situations where I'm preparing for tournaments, and then I'm just like, I can't play this deck, and I've got a week to the, till the tournament, and there's not enough time to learn the deck, and I'm screwed. And a lot of the times, in fact, going into DGC, one of the one of the lineups that we came up with that was possibly a really strong lineup actually had Control Warrior, and at the time I did not know how to play Control Warrior, so I couldn't bring that lineup, yeah. which was quite pathetic. Anyways, it's more lineup. Yeah, it's obviously very important, and when aggro is prevalent and strong, which it often is, thanks, Blizzard. Um, <laughs> yeah, when it is strong, it's important to at least know how to play the deck, whether you like it or not. So, yeah. it's kind of, I, I think this is going to be more, I know obviously it's subjective, but I'm just trying to say, try to be more objective than subjective. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so nice. Yeah, go ahead. How, like, like we just been able to know what a deck can and can't do first potential. <laughs> but I think we, we lost Pandemonia there. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, uh, I think we lost Pandemonia there. Uh, I think maybe he's back now? I, th I think your uh, internet uh, died for a second there. Okay, it looks like you're back now. Sorry, go ahead. So yeah, like I was saying, I don't know if you heard, uh, being able to know what a deck can and can't do in terms of burst potential. So you yeah. know, if you're on the receiving end, you know, you'll know you feel like you're constantly getting unlikely when they lava burst, lava burst, lightning bolt your fan. Only once you play the deck, then you know, okay, I can actually potentially deal 20 damage in a turn or, or you know, yeah. 50 damage if I draw the following cards or you know, yeah. under the following conditions. I think that's the nuances that we will get to. Yeah, I think that's true for for all decks. You know, knowing how to play a deck uh, always makes it uh, easier to know how to play around that deck. Um, but first off, let's address I think the the like um, the thing that really creates a lot of vitriol around aggro. Uh, why it's so easy to actually just hate on aggro, right? Besides the the Reddit mob mentality. Uh, there's a lot of things that make aggro um, very frustrating to play against, which make it very easy to hate. Uh, w what are your thoughts on this, Pandemonia? So I will say, and I mean, many people know this, uh, but historically, I, I was, and to a degree, um, like one of those people who absolutely hated aggro and, you know, <laughs> constantly complained about how easy the deck was to play. And I, I, I will confess, there's many times I've gone, geez, like, you know, this deck's so simple to play, whatever. But over time, and you know, with I think mature, like I feel like I've matured as a player. And when I when I have tried playing with its aggro shaman, with its pirate warrior, or you know, let's even go back face hunter. You know, when you play it, you learn. Okay, there, yes, I mean we're going to get to there are games you will win, but just because you go, absolutely go face. But there are also games you will lose because you know you miss sequence things, or you you know you didn't respect a certain card, or you know you didn't go. You know, like a lot of the things we're going to be talking about. You know, you didn't do those, and then you end up losing games that you could have or should have won. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, aggro as a whole can be very frustrating to lose against. Uh, I mean, I'm <laughs> sure I'm sure Zemok knows that firsthand as well from... Also, he and I both enjoy playing a lot of uh, uh, combo decks, which are generally very susceptible to aggro. So, like, how do you feel when you, like, lose to aggro, Zemok? I mean... I can't really comment because I've played so much aggro recently. <laughs> but, uh, there's, you know, there's some games where I'm like, geez, my opponent really played that well, you know. He set up a two-turn lethal if he drew his only out. Or, you know, there's some games where I can really respect the aggro play and I'm like, wow, he played that really well. But sometimes when your opponent just goes, I don't know, coin walks into double dread corsair, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. 
Yeah. Uh, with hardware I'm not referring to, or you know, in the old days when you had the face hunter and you just went like double nepanome on turn one, or you know, the stupid the stupid starts or a double uh, small time buccaneer, all all those things. I don't, you know, that's when it that's when it changes for me from being a very skillful deck into being, or or in my opinion, at least skillful. We'll explain why later. But um, into this thing where I just don't mm. feel happy losing to it because I don't feel like my opponent put much thought into winning. You know, yeah. there are definitely games where you you have to think and. Yeah. And they require skill, but yeah, but there, there's some games where it's just so linear, and the win really seems like it means nothing. Yeah, I think uh, that, that's that's one of the major things is that it really does feel frustrating to lose to because it's very difficult to understand the decisions that uh, the aggro player is actually making from their perspective, right? It always looks very simple when you're on the losing end of aggro, like um, you know, oh, I just didn't have this defensive card, and. Uh, he just hit me in the face, but it's usually not that not that simple from the actual aggro perspective. And I, I think one of the other things that makes it quite frustrating or quite easy to hate on is that uh, aggro is perceived at least to have a very low skill floor. Uh, so well, it does have a low skill entry yeah. level. Yeah, well, the floor for like uh, the floor is basically how poorly you can play the deck and still win. And still right? Well, still. Before well, still, win still yeah, still win enough games to like, let's say, climb ladder a bit, or you know, perform like at over a fifty percent win rate, let's say. So I don't know if you guys have any thoughts on that. Well, I mean, I or, think it has to do with. Okay, yeah, Zena. No, no, I was gonna say I don't understand. Well, okay, so so uh, so decks are perceived generally to have a skill ceiling and a skill floor. So, for example, the deck we would say that probably had the greatest skill ceiling in the history of Hearthstone is probably Patron Warrior, in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, that deck, even from the highest level pros, is uh, not even that well played. And like another deck actually would be Zoo. Like Zoo actually has ridiculous skill ceiling uh, because there's so many different ways to, to trade a lot of the time. And um, yeah, like there's a lot of, uh, at very top levels, a lot of players will disagree on how to play certain Zoo turns or something like that. Whereas a skill floor is like, uh, even if you are not very good at the game, you can still get by, you can still win games playing with this deck, right? It's, it's let's say, easier to not stuff up with this deck than uh, with other decks. So like, an example, go back to Face Hunter. You know, even if you, you could have played some turns so suboptimally, but if you just kept, kept pressing hero power and charging into the face, there's a good chance you was... can still win. The thing was with Face Hunter is you didn't even Face Hunter wasn't a zoo deck, so I mean Deb, you can explain what zoo is if if you want to do that quickly. But I think it has uh -huh. some meaning in this for sure. But um, but Face Hunter wasn't a zoo deck, right? Yeah. Whereas the uh, Agro Shaman was always a zoo deck, and Pirate Warrior is actually a zoo deck a lot of the time. And you've got weapons which make it which makes it a stupid zoo deck. And um, and the thing is, Face Hunter literally turn two is the last time you trade. You never trade it after turn two. You, 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 there are favorable <laughs> trades and you can value trade. You still go face with face hunter. There was never, because you could. Yeah. Um, yeah. Face hunter was le a lot less uh, trade orientated, and I mean, I think that why. that also contributed a lot to the perception of aggro, right? I mean, that's where all the smork memes or the SM orc memes came from, and that's where sort of the perception of aggro became that it was just. Uh, always go face place rather. Place, yeah, yeah, yeah place because it, because it was right. It was, but it's changed so much. And the thing is that perception has stayed. You know. Yeah. When it's just not, it's just not uh, still true to the to the name. Sure. Yeah. So uh, one of the other things I think that can be very frustrating uh, when playing against aggro is that it forces you into very narrow lines when you're on the receiving end of aggro, whether you're playing control or mid range or anything, it forces into you, you into whatever is essentially your most offensive game plan most of the time. Right? So yeah. from the perspective of playing against aggro, it might not feel that fun because you are always having to do the same kind of things. It's the same kind of patterns of like, what's the most offensive thing I can do rather than, you know, having to think about how greedy can I be? Uh, you know, is this too much of a commitment? All these kind of things. Whereas against aggro, it's mostly like, okay, how can I get the most stats on board whilst removing his stats as much as possible? Yeah, it's right? easier to play the aggro. It's easier to play the control deck in an aggro control mirror. Yeah, or aggro control mirror. Yeah. Say is, how do I not die? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, that, that's it. You and know, sometimes uh, top decking Reno on six is how you not you don't die. <laughs> sometimes it's still. 
right yeah um and like i think this this leads us onto the the point of like there's a lot of nuances to aggro that are easy to look over right because when it can be very frustrating when you're on the receiving end of aggro but when you begin to actually play aggro uh, there's a lot of things you actually sometimes learn about, okay, I actually made a mistake there. I missed one damage and that cost me the whole game, right? Or oh, I didn't play around that card, but I played around this other card, but I sh maybe, you know, maybe I shouldn't have played around that card. Okay, you know, that's a card that he's going to keep on the mulligan. So like watching a hand, for instance. So like, I think one of the biggest nuances that I find is is hand reading. So when you can say, I played into this, like I played into Volcanic Potion on 3 and my opponent didn't Volcanic Potion. Well, then they probably don't have Volcanic Potion. Or maybe you say, okay... I mean, they're doing a super bluff. <laughs> yeah, well, some, sometimes you can play into something but not play into it heavily enough that it is the like required thing, right? So let's say against the Reno Mage, maybe they want to Ice Barrier on 3 instead of Volcanic Potion because actually you don't have a board that's worth volcanic potioning, right? They can rather just hold the volcanic potion and then play that on, let's say, turn four with a coin and a ping or something. Um, you know, so I, I think there's a lot of things to read about your opponent's hand based on uh, the, the ways that they play and like, uh, you know, minions they put on board can indicate a lot. Like maybe they put two cards on board because they want to now taunt one of them in the next turn with a Defender of Argus or a Sun Fury Protector or something like that. So yeah, I don't know if you guys have any other like interesting hand reading I mean, things you want to mention. I think I don't know, man. I, I I don't do enough hand reading just generally to to really comment properly on that. But well, I, think I feel yeah. Uh, no, you can go. Sometimes you've just got to reach a point where you have to, you have to accept that the only way you win a game is to go if he has if he draws card X. I lose because like you say you have to have read previously to go okay he doesn't have volcanic question or he doesn't have hellfire and then decide okay at this point the only way I'll win this game yeah. is to you know put on the board go face and you know hope he doesn't pop deck it yeah, yeah so like what you can read from your opponent's previous actions about what their hand currently consists of like let's say sometimes you'll see arena like you're a pyro warrior playing against arena lock and he taps on two Chances are he, and he's kept like some cards on the mulligan, right? Chances are he might have, he, it's like a decent likelihood he has Reno in hand, right? Because tapping on two is a very awkward play if you don't know you have that heal, right? So then. I mean, you, if you're going first, yes, but if you're going second, no. In fact, if you're going first, I generally don't even like to tap if you already yes. have Reno in What I was going to say is, um, uh, it's, it's one of the issues about hand reading is that, um, you play scared and also you, um, Playing scared is a is a big mistake, and um, also, uh, what's the other thing? When you when your opponent makes a play, but actually they're baiting you. Yeah, it's a the dead thing. You force your opponent to overextend, and uh, yeah. with the yeah. mind games play a role. Yeah, well, legitimately though, you know, so as anyways, yeah, that, I don't really have much on hand reading, as such. Okay. Well, uh, I think one of the other things, the, the nuances to aggro is that like a lot of tiny mistakes get really punished. Uh, yes. So, yeah. uh, uh, your thoughts on that? I yeah. disagree with you. Oh, oh. yeah. So, uh, yeah, yeah. So missing one damage uh, really early in the game or missing a hero power or, um, you know, small things like that or making a trade where it seemed like it was a value trade but pushing face and forcing your opponent to do the trade. Uh, stuff very, like basic things like that come in come in and, and really hurt you later in the game, you know. Um, uh, even just sometimes not playing around something based on the likelihood of it being in his hand. You know, it, it's... I don't know, yeah. do, do, do you know what I mean? It's, it's very easy to play around something because yeah. you're worried that it could be there. But, you know, you spend one turn and you, 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 know, you push one damage face and instead of trading it to a minion because you assume that he doesn't have a... You know, you, you're assuming that he's gonna have to do use his minion trait, and he doesn't have the answer from hand. And then one damage will later come back to haunt you. A lot of those times, those um, those it's aggro matchups do. come down to <laughs> come down to the the micro decisions that we we're talking about. And that yeah. that micro decision could just be that one damage going face, or the two damage going face, or you know, just the tiny little tiny little bits, and it all adds up. Um, yeah, yeah it's very difficult. Yeah. Even in like the if if you look at like especially like the aggro shaman. Sometimes I've even realized myself, which 
when you had the spell power totem down to you know lightning bolt the turn before when you had yeah. the guaranteed spell power as a, yeah, you know as opposed right. to holding back the burn you know very similar to you know Leroy to go face even though it's not lethal yes it's just set up lethal you know like or Leroy to go face and then you you know if you're playing yeah. rogue you use your dagger to just to kill one of the imps and you know hope that he doesn't have the ping you know the one thing <laughs> and that's that's a play that a lot of people won't make because they're worried well you you can't push Leroy face unless it's lethal which is that's silly you can yeah, push Leroy that's... face not lethal yeah, and, I think, uh, and it's a very general play. Yeah, I think that's like, that's more of like a a big. I'd say that's more of a big mistake rather than like the small mistakes where you generally miss like one damage or something like that. No, but it could be it could be the difference between uh, okay, I'm gonna use Pirate Warrior as an example now, and you have a Nagakose and you have Leroy in hand, and you play the Nagakose, but you can push Leroy face this turn and then uh, potentially draw Mortal Strike for Lethal next turn, and you've played around Taunt. As you play yeah. the Nagakose, that five damage is never going face. Yeah, I, I mean, I understand that it's a bigger decision, but at the same time, it can be, you know, brought down a level. Sure. And you like, I, I think as you were talking about there, like micro decisions. So where where micro decisions are the small decisions you have to make on a turn by turn basis kind of thing. Um, those are a lot more important in aggro than the macro decisions of like, how do I win this game long term? Because that macro game plan is relatively straightforward a lot of the time with aggro, right? Whereas the, the micro game plan of optimizing each turn and uh, the turn afterwards are like the, the puzzle that you have to solve for aggro. Whereas uh, a lot of times with, let's say, a control mirror, you have to optimize for, uh, you know, do I spend my last removal here? What other threats does he have in the deck kind of thing? Yeah. Is it is it worth removing his or, or in aggro is it worth removing his minion or holding this damage for face stuff yeah. like that as well? Yeah. And these are yes. The thing also is so like like both the, the nuances is that some of the nuances are you know like we're saying going leeway with face, it because when you a, a newer player you know almost sort of let's say go back to your basic the basic rules you tower you know you're generally going to tower a new player. You know, you don't attack Leroy. You know, you don't use Leroy. You don't just throw. You don't just throw. <laughs> you, you, I remember when I when I was first starting Hearthstone, one of the things I used to do uh, before I got taught how to play properly was I would just throw a fireball face on four. Because exactly, that's what I'm saying. I mean, it's very I long mean... ago, obviously, very very long ago. But, <laughs> you know, I start to be told you don't just throw burn face, and then it often yeah, takes exactly. time before you recognize when is it correct to you know throw the fireball face on four because you could draw an out of, you know, a nice answer to pair with your frostball fireball, or so, uh, frostball fireball, stuff like that. You know, you yeah. have these basic principles that you teach a new player, which for most, in, you know, begin starting out, you know, it's for most intents and purposes, it's good advice. But then obviously, as you play more, gain more experience, and, you know, kind of level up and get experience, you realize, you know, yeah, sometimes there's times where you go fireball face when you don't have immediate lethal or, or Leroy face. And I think that's also part of the nuances of aggro, it's you know being able to assess when when is it that situation where I'm meant to go just throw Leroy at face, and yeah. you know that is the right play or the most optimal play. Yeah. And I think that that leads a lot into uh, playing to outs, which is I think one of the the big, uh, the often difficult to calculate nuances of aggro, right? When you have, um, let's say you have Leroy and you're going to have six mana next turn, but you need ten damage to kill him. Uh, you know then that uh, most of the four damage sources in your deck, if you're a Pyro Warrior, uh, cost more than one mana, right? So you might play Leroy on five, so that the next turn you have more chance to get that six, that four damage out. Uh, you know, in the form of like Heroic Strike or uh, Arcanite Reapers, even in those scenarios work as well, or um, uh, Corcrons, yeah. So like playing to, like one of the things you have to make, uh, one of the decisions you have to make with aggro is to play to your deck rather than sometimes necessarily playing to your hand, right? You have to do a bit of both, but a lot of the time you want to play, like as uh, you mentioned earlier, Zaymark, where you play the Leroy preemptively so that a mortal strike is still lethal even if your opponent plays taunt, right? And I think yeah. a lot of the times it's very frustrating when you're on the receiving end of that to be like, oh, he just top-decked the thing he was looking for. But, you know, actually he specifically played in order to top-deck that because that was actually the best percentage yeah. chance of winning, you know? Or you're like, oh, he top decked exactly Heroic Strike that he needed. But actually he had two Corcorons, Heroic Strike, Mortal Strike, and t like two Arcanine Reapers that he could draw, right? So that's like seven cards. So actually the chance of drawing that damage was relatively high. Yeah, and it's sometimes it's very easy, especially to like sort of, earn, let's say let's say your opponent as a part warrior has been curving out since turn one, and you can already early game start tilting 
to the point where you know you're like oh of course they chopped their you know lethal where if you sat down paused and calculated you know oh their their outs were actually pretty high and you know the guy played like you say to his outs and that's why it's kind of those compounding factors that leads you to get very tilted potentially against aggro there are many games where i've got absolutely tilted because i'm like yeah. you know turn one i mean this is one of the, my dgc games last year i still remember how upset i was uh i mean the, where turn one was uh, uh tunnel truck calling tunnel truck turn two was totem golem turn three was totem golem and then like well, I, think, the you know, I can't, rem- I, I can't no, remember no, what happened after that but you know i wasn't happy yeah okay that's a bit different though because you can't play around that <laughs> no i mean like no. not, right the nuts is the nuts but that's kind of true for all decks right that's not just like uh aggro decks if anything aggro decks are often more likely to get the nuts or like well, uh, what looks designed, like the nuts yeah. starts because that's what they're designed for yeah whereas like when a reno deck gets yeah. the nuts that's ridiculous i find so the, the... also it's the cards don't seem like the nuts, even though, like as arena player, you know that the nuts, you know, they individually a lot of the times they don't instinctively seem the nuts. If that makes sense, you know, it's not like <laughs> so. So the nuts to clarify this this phrase is just like oh, yeah. basically the the perfect draw, like the perfect plays on curve. If you could select any given cards from your deck to play on that turn, those are the cards you would select. That that's that's what we're so, that's what is often yeah. sort of referred oh, yes. to as the nuts. Yeah, yeah. I just I just want to. Uh, uh, clarify that. Okay, but uh, yeah. Uh, uh, easiest example currently is Pirate Warrior. A lot of times, it's it's things like turn one, uh, uh, Inzot's first mate. Turn two, uh, either either Fiery Warax or Blood Cell uh, Cor- uh, Corsair. Turn three, Cultist. Turn four, you know, uh, Corcon. It's kind of you know example of the nuts, I think. Yeah, but those decks have like so many options, right? You were listing the I'm what you saying, thought yeah. is the nuts there, and I'm like, oh no, actually, I think this is slightly better if you draw no, like these other different yeah. cards, right? Like, so I mean, because those decks are so low curve, they have a much higher chance of curving out like uh, as aggressively. You know, that's pretty much the point of those decks, right? That's pretty much the point of aggro yeah. decks is to do that's, that. That's the issue. Is what um one of the issues that uh, leads to people hating on aggro so much is just that um that they can curve out so easily yeah so consistently yeah and consistently right yeah okay it's it's okay so yeah yeah so i I think that 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 sort of highlights most of the the nuances to playing aggro in general Uh, i think one of the most skill intensive matchups a lot of the time even though it doesn't really seem like it is aggro mirrors or are aggro mirrors um oh yeah a lot of the time yeah yeah like Knowing uh, how to use, let's say, weapons, for instance, because at the moment most of the aggro mirrors involve weapons, and knowing uh, which minions to trade into and actually how to trade. You know, sometimes you'll sacrifice a minion uh, to prevent the, you know, instead of using a weapon so that you don't take the damage to face, uh, or, you know, sometimes you'll make sure you play around the, the removal they could have from hand. Um, yeah, I mean, your thoughts, your guys' thoughts on the aggro mirrors? Well, yeah, I find a lot of the times that like the aggro mirrors is I mean, like ironically are mostly uh, bought are mostly board centric. And I think yeah. you guys will agree with me, which and it's Definitely. quite ironic considering the reputation that aggro has as you know face of the place, and that in the in the aggro mirror, if you go face of the place, a lot of times you will lose because yeah, you will. will get board control. And yeah. Then, they might take a few turns, but they will beat you because, especially now, um, a lot of the decks are zoo-like decks as opposed to hyper aggro. You know, well, where no, no. The most, issue is that they are both at the moment, right? Yeah, the main aggro decks are all board-centric aggro decks. They're not just you know go face and burn you out. Even though that's the end game plan, yeah, that's not the the early game plan. The early game plan is all minions. And you get this mini game, right? Like in zoo, in the old zoo mirrors. You had this mini game of trading in the first three turns, and which a lot of people, yeah, a lot of people miss stuff like that. Yeah, but, um, and, and I think as you were sort of uh, alluding to there a bit, Zemok, the the idea that uh, it, like the game plan, the macro game plan actually does sometimes change, right? Whereas against a lot of control decks, when you're playing aggro, your game plan is generally just to try and kill them before they can survive, like to the late game where they're favored. Whereas um, when you're playing like aggro mirrors, the game plan is to control board and stuff so that you can, um, so that you can actually 
uh, assert your board advantage to turn, uh, you know, to turn into that into a win. <laughs> um, so, okay, so, so what I want to talk about uh, specifically on this topic of the aggro mirrors is that um, a lot of the time with, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna refer a lot to Power Rock because I I mean I've played so much of that recently. That that mirror, um, as much as it is draw dependent, it is so skill intensive. I feel at least, and um, something that that's worth, or in my opinion at least, that's um, worth saying is that the person going first should always be hyper aggressive and try to be as aggressive as possible, and the person going second can usually just play a defensive game plan and win. Um, yeah. And this is something that I see a lot of the time just missing. Um, is as the player going second, you start with an extra card and you start with coin, which means you can, um, you know, you can get ahead really early. You can do a lot of sick combos with the coin in Pirate Warrior. Yeah. It's something that's often overlooked. You can do stuff with coin and Warax and um, Dread Corsairs and upgrades. And like, there's a lot of um, cards that are really good with coin. Um, and so going second, and you're actually favored in that mirror. And what a lot of people do is they don't play for board early. And you should really just be trying to play for board early going second. I, I don't want to get too in depth here, but. Um, it's just it's a really good example of why of where skill and aggro mirrors can be such a big thing. Yeah. Um, you know, trading trading early, getting board control early, and then pushing face and forcing your opponent to use his minions to trade or use his face to trade rather than you doing the trades. And that that can only happen once you're ahead, and you can only get ahead if you've taken uh, board control early, and then you get initiative later. Yeah, um, or where you can force your opponent to use like mortal strikes on your minions or Corcrons yeah, to sure. charge for trade. That's when you know you're in a good position in like that mirror a lot of the time. Yeah, I mean, yeah, like we, Aggro Shaman, if they lava burst in your minion, also, yeah, they, you know, yeah. a lot of times you're feeling pretty comfortable. Yeah, I mean, I mean we were you're never out of the woods, but yeah, we we were um uh, like co-oping, co-oping, and about to come as um one of my games last night, Pirate Warrior. And it was in a Pirate Warrior mirror, and my opponent had to mortal strike one of my two ones. And that's just because. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, remember. And it's just early game, take control, and then sit back and let your opponent use his removal. And, you know, I mean, you obviously have to avoid swing turns where they can play something like a Warx and Dread Corsair and just completely swing the tempo. But outside of um, cards like the Dread Corsair, which comes up a lot, uh, because I feel that it's such a big part in the Pirate Warrior mirror. Outside yeah. of that card, there's very few ways that the tempo can be swung once uh, once either player has the tempo. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And also it reaches like, but you know, just bridging on to that is, is it reaches a point where also you go, okay, I'm I'm so far ahead, I've got this tempo. Now I'm just going to go face, and you know your opponent plays dart, you know tries to come back, and then you just now race them. And as soon as you kind of assess that you're in a, a dominating. Uh, you, you know, you lead tempo wise. You go, okay. I just now go face, and yeah. you obviously, no pirate warrior doesn't have heal, for example. Yeah, it yeah. doesn't have that many well, armor. Well, yeah. exactly. But then, and a big mistake that people make in the mirror is playing Finney on one. You shouldn't play Finney on one going second usually. It's usually bad. Uh, yeah, well, and I think one of the bigger mistakes people make a lot of the time is actually taking life tap when they do play Finley. Oh, that's like. Finley is, Finley is, like life tap is terrible. That deck, that game, that matchup is usually never about resources, and you can pretty much never actually use like the lose the early tempo, right? Like Finley is not bad as a one three body, but then you want a, a hero power like fire blast or something that's actually going to allow you to, you know, be on board. Sometimes even uh, lesser heal is okay. Yeah, I was going to say that Finley. Uh, the reason sometimes I would play it on turn one. Is because it does fight off the one-one pirates quite yeah, efficiently. Yeah, th that's the only reason, right? You you play yeah. it to fight off the one-one, but you don't take life tap, and a lot of the time it's not great to play on one. Yeah, and you you generally don't yeah, necessarily even want like steady shots a lot of the time. Yeah, you'd rather take ping over steady shots in the mirror. Yeah. Yeah, because the yeah. Yeah, oh, one of the one of the mirrors I actually miss a lot is uh, the aggro shaman mirror. Like I I think the aggro shaman mirror was even more skill intensive. I find than the. Uh, Pirate Warrior one, uh, the Aggro Shaman Mirror, especially like before uh, the Spirit Claws nerf and stuff, it was it was really tight and like what you would ho hold in the Mulligan wouldn't necessarily be like that intuitive a lot of the time, like uh, based on your hand, sometimes you would hold Trogs, sometimes you chuck Trogs, you know it depends whether you're going first or second, whether you have coin, uh, as to whether the weapons are good as well, like sometimes you'll hold Dalnos just to activate your Spirit Claws, you know those kind of things. 
Um, like I found that mirror really uh, skill intensive actually. And I, I found it was a pretty interesting mirror. And also like when you can actually use burn on minions and it's good, right? And like going second, for example, you keep lightning bolt. Going first, you don't keep lightning bolt a lot of the time. Those kind of things. Yeah, but also like uh, interesting sort of, uh, I think it was in Dada, uh, it was in Vicious Syndicate, the Dada Reaper, where they did the analysis of you know, when people, uh, especially when aggro shaman was so popular, about the win rates as uh, compared to turns where you used Maelstrom Portal. I don't know yeah. if you if you saw that. But I, I think it ties in quite that. nicely because it was a case of they found sort of a very strong correlation that when in a uh, when a shaman player held onto their Maelstrom Portal for uh, and only played it later in the game, they their win rate was a lot higher than than if they played it earlier in Agro Shaman Mirrors. <coughs> I know, think the ability to not have to waste, not have to use it like on turn two, and rather saving it to try and get a bigger turn, uh, you know, a bigger swing a turn. Tempo swing. Yeah. yeah, I think I think the big thing there is that when you can play it later in the game, you're already in a better position, right? The longer you can, the longer you can hold it, it's like a luxury as well, right? Whereas if you have to play it early, then generally you're, I'd say, in a worse position overall. I, I, you know, so I think actually the fact that it, it is hulled is actually sometimes an indicator of the matchup rather than an indicator of success in the matchup, if you know what yeah. I mean. So it's an indicator of how the matchup's already going rather than uh, they're winning because they're a bit like holding it. So, uh, but yeah. you know what I'm saying? It's a correlation causation yeah. issue, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, and I mean, I, th I think that's uh, enough that we've spoken about aggro mirrors. One of the the other obvious like matchups that we see a lot of the time is is aggro versus control, right? And this is one of the mirrors, the, the matchups that we spoke about a bit earlier, and how it like yeah, feels really bad from the control perspective, you know, because the control game plan is actually um, a lot easier than the aggro game plan, as I think Zemok was saying earlier. Um, do you want to elaborate on this a bit, Zemok? Uh, I mean, I, I think we almost covered all of it didn't, earlier, didn't we? Oh, okay. Well, the the main thing was that um, uh, as the as the aggro player, you have to calculate odds constantly and you have to try and work out what's going to be your most uh, efficient turn, right? Mm. In terms of using your uh, resources that you have available to you. Do you want to develop the weapon now? Do you want to push face with that weapon? Uh, do you want to maybe push face with the weapon in case you draw another weapon? Would you rather play a minion and hold back on the weapon? Um, stuff like that. There's a lot of decision making that goes into aggro in that matchup a lot of the time. Now, yeah. a lot of the time there also isn't. Um, because a lot of the time it's Okay, I'm gonna play my Zoss first mates on one, and on turn two I'm gonna play my Blood Soul Corsair. I think it's no Raider. That's and then on uh, turn three I'm gonna play my Saucy Captain, and then on turn four I'm probably just gonna win the game because my opponent's gonna concede. That, that does happen. <laughs> uh, yeah, sure. That does happen. But um, there are a lot of matchups where there's a um, where there is a lot of skill uh, and decision making as I went into. And um, one of those matchups is uh, from sorry from the control perspective, it's a lot easier because a lot of the time uh, I'm executing control warriors. So I'm thinking more on Reno Mage and uh, Reno Lock um, uh, for various reasons, um, but also just experience. I've got a lot of experience with those decks. Um, a lot of the time, you just okay. Do I have the volcanic potion on three? Yes. Do I have the frostbolt on two? Yes. Do I have the arcane blast on one? Yes. Do I have Kazakus on four? Yes. You know stuff like that. Do I have Reno on six? Yes, great. And <laughs> yeah. I don't have those cards. No, not great. Uh, little decision making. When you're playing defensive as the control player in the matchup, you're just looking how do I take as little damage this turn as possible, yeah. rather than saying, um, rather than saying, okay, what is going to maximize my outs? Because you're not playing to outs, you're just playing defensive. Yeah. Um, and the issue where this stems from is that when the aggro deck. Um, when your answers to the Adagro deck are so linear that they like you have so few answers and you only get them so so you know little right um because the aggro deck is so consistent that's when the issue comes in right yeah um the reason people no one really complains about reno being the reno decks being the most retarded and horrible decks and okay a lot of times people do complain when you just have reno on six but um you don't see as much hate on reno decks sorry about my dog you don't sure. see as much hate on Reno decks because it's not as much of, um, you know, uh, it's not, it's less linear, right? Yeah. You know what I mean? And the, cur the curve is a lot less guaranteed a lot of times. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, and also, I, I think, yeah, go ahead. In terms of playing like aggro versus control, I think we chatted a bit of, a bit about it. But the f fact that you know you've got to okay, you set up board, and then it becomes a case of you know do you go full out for the phase to try and, and, and hope they don't have Reno or hope they don't have the clear, or do you hold back, try beta up the removal, and then you know try push from there, and then even more it's you know now that still Reno's in the the meta, it's a case of do you set it up in a in a in a position where they have to have either, like where they need the heal and the the clear, but they can yeah. only do one. So that that's kind of obviously what your the dream is. Is you set up a big enough board that even if they Reno, you probably can still put enough pressure yeah. that yeah. you can still win. I whereas feel that. Yeah. Sorry. 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 No, no, but where, whereas if they flame strike or twist the nether, you still have arts of just winning that turn anyway. Yeah. So sometimes when you would keep the damage. Uh, that could come from hand immediately, like the weapon or something like that. Instead, just play our minion. Like maybe you play a Naga Corsair for no immediate value because you don't already have the weapon equipped, right? Uh, and then if yeah. they nether or something, okay, then you have the Naga Corsair to... And then you have the weapon to hit face um, or something like that, you know, for like lethal. Or then, or maybe you play the weapon instead to set up for the next turn, like if it's not going to Reaper, where you would be able to hit them in the face for lethal. So they then have to Reno and then you still have a good board, you know? I definitely feel like that's less of a nuance though, because a lot of the time that is dependent on how you drew that game. Sure, but but you can sometimes trade and such to maximize, uh, you know, how you would play around certain AOE and like to try and set up the board where you can maybe win like post Reno, right? Where you or sort of maximizing your your chances and your outs. I think one of the key things that you sort of touched on a bit earlier is that. Uh, the, the the control player is really just playing to what's in their hand, right? They they don't have the the luxury of going. Maybe if I draw this, I can you know I can play to this out. Sometimes you maybe play to your Reno out or something like that, right? But most of the time yeah. you're like, okay, I'm just I have to play whatever's in my hand. That's the most defensive thing. I will play that to reduce the amount of damage I am taking in the next two turns, right? Whereas then all of a sudden the aggro deck a lot of the time is actually playing to outs. Like oh it, you know if I, I, if I top deck the mortal strike to stop the taunt. Uh, all those kind of things, you know. So I think uh, that's also one of the things that can actually make sometimes the game plan a lot easier for the control deck in that uh, matchup. Yeah, it's also that as a control player, like you know, like like you you exclude a control warrior, but as you feel control warrior, you start the game and you feel behind from you know the word go because you're not playing anything turn one, turn two you're either armoring up or you're playing fiery wax, and then you know a lot of the, the rest of your mm. game from there on is constantly going. Okay, how do I manage my resources? So hopefully I'm alive by turn five brawl, and hopefully you know I'm alive to play turn six justice car. Hopefully I'm alive to you know uh, you know uh, tank up and shield block. Yeah. You know, yeah. It's, it's constantly trying to just manage your resources, and it's almost you're almost in a sort of from the word go, you're in the sense of like defensive yeah, panic yeah, like going. Oh my, yeah, like, uh, oh my goodness, I'm uh, gonna, am I gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna draw the out that I need, you know? Well, not yeah, am I going to uh, not die, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Whereas, you know, you feel like you're under a lot less pressure as the aggro player because you're the aggressor. Yeah. You're yeah. the one pressure, so you feel less intimidated or, under, uh, you know, less under pressure. Yeah. That makes you're sense. basically forcing your opponent, right, to do things for exactly. you. Yeah. You, yeah, you're never in the situation where you're like, oh, I need this to happen, you know? Yeah. Whereas, like, the yeah. Uh, I think we've, we've covered this pretty well. I'd say that like overall our feelings are that even though aggro might have uh, a lower skill floor, that there's a lot of nuances that a lot of people miss with uh, aggro. Maybe sometimes people, because they have a bad perception of it, then they don't play it, and then they don't actually understand the nuances uh, of the deck like from the player's perspective. And just because when you're playing against it, a lot, a lot of the time it feels very linear, and it can feel really bad losing to aggro. But um, I think it's important not to underestimate the skill that actually does go into playing aggro, right? I, I think you guys would agree that that's sort of been the, the theme of our discussion. Yeah, I'm like, we're not, we're not, we're not oh, like, oh, aggro is the most skillful deck, but the public perception is definitely... Um, that anybody can play aggro to legend and kind of... It's, well. I'm, trying to, I'm trying to say it's, um, it's too... Skewed. It's almost too anti. Yeah, it's too yeah. skewed, right? Yeah. It's... it's yeah. Yeah, it's very anti-aggro, which, I mean, sure, you can hit an aggro, but there's a lot more skill than people give credit for. And I think that's the yeah. that's the main point of this whole thing, right? We just want to give credit where yeah, credit yeah. is. Yeah. I think, I think it is a very... level finishes as well. 
Yeah, I think it's a very uh, easy thing to head on. And I think what we want is we also want to encourage viewers to actually uh, play everything, you know, don't don't be prejudiced against any like deck archetype, you know, maybe you also maybe you hate control warrior, maybe you hate Reno decks, you know, like, uh, you've got to play them all to improve as a player. And I think that that's very important uh, sort of takeaway from this as well. I mean, obviously, if, if your collection allows for it, you know, you always do want sure. to try and broaden your horizons, be able to know, okay, what deck, what can a deck do? What can't it do? Uh, you know, how good is a deck in a certain matchup? How do you play it? How much damage can it do from hand a lot of times? So, you know, yeah. Pirate Warrior, your burst consists of a lot, like Leroy, you know, and also even then, even sort of it helps you with, uh, sort of subconsciously with the hand reading with that, you know, when you play Pirate Warrior and you realize, okay, you're constantly holding Leroy and Mortal Strike, you then, you know, with, then you now go, okay, now my opponent, he's had these two cards in his hand since early on and he hasn't used yeah, them. Yeah, they must be burn or something. They must be, the, the chances are they consist of, you know, Leroy, Mortal Strike yeah, or yeah. Heroic, you know, Heroic Strike, you know. Yeah. Those hand, it helps with hand reading as well. Yeah. Um, so overall, uh, I think, you know, we've, we've summarized this, or well, we've gone over uh, aggro pretty extensively. Uh, thanks to everyone for uh, tuning in and uh, watching this on YouTube if you're doing that. Uh, and please um, follow and uh, subscribe on YouTube and uh, all those things. Uh, follow us on Twitter as well. All the Twitter handles are spread around. Um, you know, it, it let us know if you if you now hate us and we're scum of the earth because we defended <laughs> aggro, or uh, you know, let us let us know your thoughts. Maybe we missed some nuances of aggro. Maybe we're actually terrible aggro players, and you're like, oh my god, these guys forgot to mention something. You know, let us know in the comments or on Twitter or anything like that. <laughs> Um, yeah, so uh, thanks a lot, everyone, and uh, until next time, cheers from me. Cheers. Yeah.